All right, shalom, shalom, everybody, shalom. Welcome back to the channel. Today, we're going to be getting into some persecutions, some migrations, and some events that led to our ancestors coming into Africa or coming into the interiors of Africa, should I say. All right, we say we Israelites, but do we know our history? Do we actually know how we got to Nigeria, how we got to um, these areas that we got to? In the sub-Saharan regions. So like I said, we're going to review some information. We're going to review some scripture. And we're going to look at how our people will go through Egypt and spread out to the surrounding areas. And then go into the interiors. Alright, so the first thing we're going to start off by doing is going to the founding of Carthage. Now the founding of Carthage took place around 814 BCE. Now go ahead and fact check me just to be sure, but if I'm not mistaken, it was 814 BCE. Now Carthage was founded by a woman named Dido. All right, Dido was also known as Alassa or Alyssa. She was the legendary founder and first queen of the Phoenician city-state of Carthage, located in modern Tunisia. All right, so Carthage is modern-day Tunisia, which is northwestern Africa. Known only through ancient Greek and Roman sources, most of which were written well after Carthage's founding, her historiocracy remains uncertain. In most accounts, she was the queen of the Phoenician city-state of Tyre, today Sir in Lebanon, who flees to Rainy to found her own city in northwestern Africa. All right, so this, this is important because we see that she was a queen over the Phoenician city-state of Tyre. So everybody turn to Joshua 19, 24 through 31. And when we turn to Joshua 19 and 24, we see the lots or the territories of Asher being named off. And if we go down to verse 29, we can clearly see that Tyre is a city of Asher. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Dido, before she came to Carthage or Northwestern Africa, she was the queen over the city Tyre, which is a territory of Asher. Furthermore, we're going to jump to Hebrewisms of West Africa, and this is by Joseph J. Williams. Okay, the Jews of Carthage. There is an old tradition among the nomadic tribes of Tunisia that the Jews settled in the country before the destruction of the first temple. And although the statement has been sometimes regarded as unfounded, there can be little doubt that a colony of Jews existed in Carthage soon after the building of the city. All right. We just review how Carthage was founded by around 814 BCE. So we have Israelites within northwestern Africa during this 814 BCE period, during the founding of Carthage. So just keep that in the back of your mind as well. I'm going to jump to the other highlighted part. It says they founded merchant um, deports along the North African shores, generally placed in charge of the Jews. All right. So that's just furthermore showing us that they was along the North African shores as well. So they was up in North Africa. But let's continue to dig on this. We're going to jump to page 189. It says right here, there are indications in the Bible as well as in the works of ancient writers and Phoenician inscriptions discovered from time to time that a number of Hebrew settlers or slaves followed the Phoenicians and the excursions across the Mediterranean. Let me read that again. So the Hebrew settlers or slaves followed the Phoenicians across the Mediterranean. Now, didn't Dido go from <laughs> Tyre across the Mediterranean to Carthage? Let's keep going. Inscriptions indicate that certain tribes of Asher and Zebulun lived in Carthage ever since the founding of the city. All right. So this is why I said it is important for us to remember Dido and Tyre all being connected to Asher because it shouldn't be strange for us to see that the tribe of Asher was one of the first cities in Carthage. Excuse me. One of the first tribes within Carthage, because like it said, the Israelites or the Hebrews was following these Phoenicians 
into Carthage. Now, more than likely, what happened? Tribes of Asher and Zebulun left with Dido in 814 BCE when she left Tyre to go found Carthage. All right. And finally, we have seen that in all probability, there were Jews in Carthage and its dependencies, large numbers of Jews who followed the Phoenicians to, into Africa. All right. So that's just furthermore, you know, substantiating the fact that Israel went into Africa during these times or during around excuse me, around the time of the founding of Carthage. So it's well known. Two Nordic Kingdom tribes within North Africa during this time. So everybody jump to Jeremiah 40, and uh, we're going to start at verse 5. We're going to get a little information from the scripture, a little information from the scripture. Now, while he was not yet gone back, he said, Go back to Gedaliah, the son of Anakon, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon have made governor over the cities of Judah, and dwell with him among the people, or go wheresoever it seemeth convenient unto thee to go. So the captain of the guard gave him victuals and a reward, and let him go. Then Jeremiah went up to Gedaliah, excuse me, Gedaliah, the son of Anakon, to Mizpah, and dwelt with him among the people that were left in the land. All right, so his people left in the land. Now, when all the captains of the forces which were in the fields, even they that their man heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah the son of Adonkin governor in the land, and had committed unto him men and women and children and the poor of the land of them that were not carried captive away to Babylon. All right, so we see that there were still people from Judah in the land of Judah during this time and, and Jeremiah went down and dwelt among them. So we're going to jump up to verse um, 11. We're still in chapter 40. It says, Likewise, when all the Jews that were in Moab and among the Ammonites and in Edom and that were in all the countries heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant of Judah and that they had set over them Gadaliah, the son of Anakin, the son of Shaphan, so all the bruised Right, all the children of Judah that's scattered abroad, that's still around these locations, got word that what? It was still a remnant of Judah left in the land, and that Gadaliah had been placed over them. Verse 12 Even all the Jews were turned out of all the places where they had been driven, and came to the land of Judah, to Gadaliah, unto Mizpah, and gathered wine and summer fruits very much. So the children of Judah that was taken away had replaced from the surrounding areas. So, so like verse 12 said, even all the Jews returned out of all the places where they had been drew, um, driven and came to the land of Judah. All right. So they went back to the land of Judah. But let's jump to Jeremiah 43, um, 1 through 7. And we're going to get some more information on this. Get some more information. What was going on with the children of Judah and what they did? So we're going to start at verse one. It says, and it came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking to all the people, all the words of the Lord, their God, for which the Lord, their God had sent to them, even all these words. Then spake Azariah, the son of Hosea, and Joan, the son of Korea, and all the proud men saying unto Jeremiah, thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. But Baruch, the son of Neriah, said of thee on against us, for to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans, that they might put us to death and carry us away captives to Babylon. So Israel, so Judah, at this time, thinking that Jeremiah is trying to send them to the Chaldeans to go, you know what I'm saying, back into captivity, go be carried captive into Babylon. But the whole time he telling the words of the Most High. Verse 4. So Janan, the son of Kiri, and all the captains of the forces and all the people obeyed not the voice of the Lord to, do, to dwell in the land of Judah. So they obeyed not the voice of the Lord to dwell in the land of Judah. But Jahanan, the son of Kiri, and all of the captains of the forces took all the remnant of Judah. They took all the remnant of Judah. All right that returned from all the nations, whether they had been driven to, to dwell in the land of Judah. 
All right. So instead of going into Judah, we're going to see what they did in verse six, even men and women and children and king's daughters and every person that Nebuchadnezzar, the captain, the guard had left with Gadaliah, the son of Anakin, the son of Shaphan, and Jeremiah, the prophet, and Baruch, the son of Neriah. So they came into the land of Egypt, for they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Thus they even came to Taphanes. Excuse me. Thus they came even to Taphanes. So we see that what? They did not obey the voice of the Father. They said, no, we're not going to dwell in the land of Judah. And they went into the land of Egypt. They was, you feel me? They was being disobedient. They was being stiff necked because what they thought Jeremiah was going to send them to the Chaldeans to go back into captivity. But furthermore, to go more into the fact that they did dwell in Egypt, we're going to go to Jeremiah 44. And he says, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwelt in the land of Egypt, which dwelt at Midal and Taphanes and Noph, and in the country of Patros, saying, so let me stop right there. When he's speaking on Egypt and uh, Middle and Taphanes and Noph and Patros, um, those are all cities within the interiors of Egypt. We all know that Patros is lower Egypt or um, down near Nubia. And so is um, Noph and Taphanes and Middle. These are all territories or cities within Egypt. So, but let's continue to read. Verse 2, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, ye have seen all the evil that I have brought up upon Jerusalem and upon all the cities of Judah. And behold, this day they are a desolate and no man dwell therein. Because of their wickedness, which they have committed to provoke me to anger, and they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they knew not, neither ye nor your fathers. How be it, I sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early, and sent to them, saying, Oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear to turn from their wickedness, to burn no incense unto other gods. All right, so we see our people were being stiff-necked. They wasn't listening to the prophets. They was following other gods. They was doing wickedness. And they provoked the father unto anger. All right. So that was one of the important things. They provoked the father into anger. Furthermore, we're going to jump to verse 11 in um, the same chapter, in chapter 44. It says, verse 11, Therefore, thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will set my face against you for evil and to cut off all of Judah. All right. So the father said, I will set my face against you for the evil and to cut off all of Judah. And I will take the remnant of Judah that have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to so join there. And they shall be all consumed and fall in the land of Egypt. They even Excuse me, they shall even be consumed by the sword and by the famine. They shall die from the least unto the greatest by the sword and by the famine. And they shall be an excretion and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach. All right, verse 13. For I will punish them that dwelt in Egypt, as I have punished Jerusalem by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. Now keep this in mind. The Father just said that he will punish those that dwell in the land of Egypt as he has punished Jerusalem by what the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. Verse 14 So that none of the remnant of Judah, which are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there, shall escape or remain. All right, he said they're not going to escape the sword, nor they will, will they remain, that they should return into the land of Judah to the which they have a desire to return to the welder for none shall return, but such as shall escape. All right. So he said, you're not going to return to Judah or to the land of Judah. So my whole point of bringing this out was to just show you all the fact that even within our very scriptures, we can see accounts of our ancestors going into different regions in Africa, going into different locations, right? It was nothing for our ancestors to just pick up and go. Right. He said they settled in different locations in Egypt. Right. 
Nof and, and Patros and, and um, Taffanese, right? So this should be understood, but we're going to continue to review some evidence. And um, now we're about to take it to Egypt, actually, and look at some um, evidence of our people there. All right. So and to do that, we're going to be jumping to Jews and Greeks in ancient Serene. I'm going to start in the beginning and highlight it. It says, evidence of Claritic settlement is absent in Egypt into 750, um, 700, 275 BC, although it is generally thought to have begun earlier. From 259 BC, we hear of Jews settled on the land, always as individuals among non Jews, among them Claritic men of the Ekpon and simple peasants. Furthermore, Next highlight, it says, on the other hand, we know from Hecatheus of a group of Jews who came from Judea, a group of Jews who came from Judea to settle in Egypt at this time and appear to have obtained distinct charter for Ptolemy Lagos. Egyptian epigraphy at Papyrology show the existence of Jewish villages as early as the third century BC. So we see that it is well known that the Jews were settled in Egypt as early as, or Jews were settled in Egypt as early as the third century BC. Not to mention, we see that specifically Judeans, all right, people of Judah, Judeans settled in Egypt during this time as well. Flavius Josephus attributes Jewish settlements in Serene to the time of Ptolemy Lagos, and in the light of historical reality, we must connect the establishment of Jewish population in the country with the growth of the Hellenistic Jewish community of Egypt. Josephus writes that Ptolemy entrusted fortresses to Jews in Egypt and desiring to strengthen his hold over Serene and the other cities of Libya sent part of the Jews to inhabit them. All right, so the Israelites were being sent to Libya, right, more than likely by force, by sword, right, to inhabit or to populate Libya, as it was just said, a certain city in Libya, to be more precise. Elsewhere, he says that since Serene and Egypt had been placed under unite rule, so they was under rule, Serene had supported numerous organized groups of Jews which flourish and continue to practice their Jewish laws. This information follows immediately after Josephus reference to a Jewish political disturbance at Serene in the time of Sula. Hence it is to be assumed that it relates to the period after the unification of Serene and Egypt under the rule of Eurogrites II in 145 BC. Josephus further relates that Ptolemy Lagos settled Jewish prisoners, settled Jewish prisoners, Jewish prisoners from Judea in Egypt and distributed them among his garrisons, while other Jews immigrated to the country voluntarily. In the same book, he writes that Ptolemy freed 120,000 Jewish prisoners in Egypt. Egypt. All right. The liberation of Jewish prisoners is confirmed by the Eretrices letter, which says Ptolemy brought a number of Jews from Syria, some of them prisoners of war, to settle in Egypt, placing 30,000 of them in his fortresses. Three silent facts can be distinguished among these quotations. One, that the Jewish colonization in Libya was connected, in Josephus' view, with their settlement in Egypt. It took place in similar conditions. Two, that which regard to Serene, Josephus speaks of two periods or stages of Jewish immigration, namely of the first settlement and subsequently of the situation created by the union of Egypt and Censorina in the second half of the second century BC. All right, so this was just to establish and let you all know that the Israelites that was in Egypt at this time period around the second century BC was being sent over to populate Libya. All right. Sent over to populate cities in Libya, as well as being distributed through other cities and countries throughout the Northwestern territories. 
Now, with that being said, we all know Acts 13 and 1. Now, there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas, and Simeon that was called Nigger, and Lucius of Serene. Now, I got this highlighted because we always read this just because it's called Simeon Niger. But what we don't notice is it speaks of Serene. Now, Serene is Libya, North Africa. So with that being said, we had two Israelites, Simeon and Lucius, coming out of Serene during the time of Christ, during the time of Paul, right? During this time of Antioch to indulge in this event, to indulge in the helping of Christ, right? So more than likely, Simeon and Lucius was descended of these Israelites that came from Egypt and populated or helped inhabit cities in Serene. Here's the picture of a North African Jew. This was taken in 1880, around 1880. This is more than likely what Simeon and Lucius looked like. Right? What we all look like. And even when we look at this detailed picture, we see something very similar to what the scriptures tell us. Not cutting the edge of our borders, of our beard. All right. Well, let's continue on. Let's jump to Babylon, the Timbuktu. We're going to get some information out on this. So we don't, so far we've got Israelites going into Carthage um, around 800 BCE, 814 BCE, as well as Israelites going into Egypt around the second century. BC and then them from um there they was going from Egypt and being sent into Libya and during that same time period. So we're gonna start right here at the very top. It says when Antiochus the fourth of Spurs the throne in Syria, all right, this was around 175, 163 BC, he entertained the thought of uniting Alexander's empire. This meant the conquest of Egypt. However, the province that bordered on Egypt was Palestine, which stood in his way. At this time, the Jews would not accept Greek culture. Nevertheless, Antiochus was determined to Hellenize the Jews. All right. The army of Antiochus marched into Palestine to support Menias, the leader of the pro-Syrian party. As a result, many Jews were killed. Others escaped to the hills and to Egypt. Only those that supported Antiochus' policies remained in Jerusalem. An edict was promulgated interdicting the observance of the holidays, the Shabbat, and circumcision. A statue of Jupiter was erected in the holy temple above the altar. All right, now when I read this, this immediately reminded me of the event going on in Sacrament Maccabees. And when we turn to Sacrament Maccabees, chapter 6, we read something extremely similar, right? If this is not the same event. But we turn to Sacrament Maccabees. We're going to start on um, first verse 1 of chapter 6. It says, not long after this, the king sent an old man of Athens to compel the Jews to depart from the laws of their fathers and to not live after the laws of God. All right. And to pollute also the temple of Jerusalem. All right. To pollute also the temple in Jerusalem and to call it the temple of Jupiter Olympias. And that in the reason of Jupiter defender of strangers, as they did desire that dwelt in the place. All right. So they call the temple Jupiter, just as in what we was reading during the time of Antiochus. They put a statue of Jupiter in the altar. Furthermore, this, the coming in this mischief was sore and grievous to the people. For the temple was filled with riot and revealing by the Gentiles who died with harlots and had to do with the women within the circuit of the holy places. And besides that, brought in things that were not lawful. All right. Didn't we just learn that pigs was brought in? Things that are not lawful. Furthermore, the altar was filled with profane things, which were which the law forbidden. 
Neither was it lawful for a man to keep the Shabbat days or ancient feasts or to profess himself at all to be a Jew. All right. So this is going hand in hand with what we just read. Furthermore, because of this religious persecution, the legitimate high priest Oanus the third and many other Jews fled into African countries such as Egypt, Ethiopia, and Serene, which is Libya. Throughout the last 2,500 years, the main factors that have contributed to the social migrations of Jews were wars, religious persecutions, and commerce. All these factors were operating and gave rise to the African Jewish population. So it was a migration of Israelites in Africa or through into Egypt, Ethiopia, and Serene as well during the time of the Roman conqueror Antiochus. And this was um around 145 BC as well. We're gonna jump back to Hebrewisms of West Africa, get some more information out. And it says the Jews of North of the North African coast from Tunisia to Morocco, although not as ancient residents as those in Egypt, have nevertheless been settled in the country at least since the second century AD. By the fifth century, they were numerous and had converted to Judaism server several Berber tribes who offered vigorous opposition to the advance of the Muslim conquerors a century or two later. All right, so by the fifth century, they were numerous, all right? So it was Israelites all the way through Northern Africa. That's what we have to understand. These were the first locations the Israelites went when they was looking for freedom, when they was looking for asylum. But let's continue to read. All right, that there were many Jews, however, in Northern Africa long before the second century. There can be little question. In fact, as we shall see, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem by Titus undoubtedly found well-established and influential Jewish colonies located there. To which refugees from the fallen city fled for asylum. Nay, more we hope to show that almost from the earliest days of the Phoenician adventure, which was the founding of Carthage, the Jews, at first as individuals and then in small groups, identified themselves with commercial enterprises of Tyre and Sidon. All right. So we were just getting some more information out on these brews that was in North Africa, letting you know that they was um, settled there before the fifth century, settled there um, well after the destruction of the, um, Jerusalem by Titus. All right. And that they was fleeing there for asylum. We just read that what? When Antiochus came in and did his thing, Israelites fled into Egypt and Serene and Ethiopia. So we should have this understanding that when the Israelites was in trouble, they would flee into Egypt and throughout other countries bordering Egypt as well or throughout other northern African territories as well. I'm going to start right here. It says two centuries and a half earlier, Lancelot Addison, who spent several years among the Jews of Barbary, had observed the Jews of this continent must resemble the Spaniard and Portuguese in their stature and complexion. All right. If you've watched my videos, if you watch the series on the Spanish and Portuguese brews, you will understand and you will know that what? The Spanish Jews are always dark complexion. All right. We've brought this out numerous of times. So it, it should be the same thing when we're looking at the Jews on this country since they're being compared to them with their stature and complexion. And when they're speaking of Barbary, um, the Barbary states, the Jews of Barbary, that's dealing with the Jews of Northern Africa, right? But are much different in their nature and disposition as being more flexible and subsequentious especially in things whereby they may reap advantage. They are not pretemporary in, into, um, initially to themselves to any particular tribes, yet they generally believe that they are the remains of Judah and Benjamin, and together with a few among them, the families of Levi. All right, so we have this established. We have families of Judah, um, Benjamin and Levi. We have families of Asher and Zebulun. 
during these times, all right, in the North African countries. Furthermore, we're going to jump back to Babylon to Timbuktu, and we're going to get some more events. So we should have the understanding that Israel has been in Africa for a very long time, especially Egypt, especially Libya, right, especially Tunisia. And while they was in these locations, it was events going on that led to migrations further down to the Sahara. And one of those events we're going to get into is the rebellions of 115 AD or the Roman Wars of 115 AD. So we see, I'm going to start in the highlight it and it reads, after the fall of the Carthaginian metropolis in North Africa, Roman power became dominant in the Barbary states. On the Roman Caesarianity and its power, the Jews of Asia and North Africa rebelled around 115 AD. The Jews considered themselves numerous enough to challenge Roman authority in the East and the South. Because of their numbers, the Jews almost subdued their adversaries who had compelled them to suffer many atrocities and indignities. Next page. The pagans and the Romans attacked the Jews indiscriminately. Both the Jewish soldiers and the uninvolved peaceful population without mercy. As a result of this merciless attack, many Jews fled to those parts of Northwest Africa known as Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and Mauritania. Many other Jews fled to the areas where Rome did not have any jurisdiction. Let me read that again because that's important. Many other Jews fled to areas where Rome did not have any jurisdiction. This was the region of the South, the Sahara Desert, and the Sudan, Grizel says, such is the explanation of how the Sahara Desert first acquired Jewish tribes toughened by a fighting tradition and possessed physical, char physical characteristics, which is black which it is said still makes them approximately very closely the original Jewish population of Palestine. All right, so we see when the Romans and the pagans would attack them or when they attacked them during this 115 AD event, they migrated further over west across the North, northern um, African regions. All right, they migrated over to Algeria and to Morocco and Mauritania and others fled down into the Sahara Desert. Now let's continue to get some more information out on this specific event of 115 AD. And to do that, we're going to be jumping to the African origins of the major Western religions. And we're going to start in the highlighted section. In North Africa, just before the period of Christianity's legal entry into Rome, Due to Constantine the Great conversion in the 4th century, there were many Hebrew tribes that are of indigenous African origin. All right, so-called Negroes, as they have in uh, parentheses. Now, making them indigenous um, to northern Africa or to Africa would just mean that their ancestors were there for a very long time and they was born uh, on that soil or in that location. Like I will be indigenous to or native to Tennessee, right? I'm a native of Tennessee, but furthermore, these African Jews, as all other Romanized Africans of this area, were caught up in a rebellion in Serene, since Arena during 115 CE. All right, this is the same thing as AD against Roman imperialism and colonism. All right, so they was trying to come down and colonize these areas. All right, this rebellion also marked the beginning of a mass Jewish migration southward into the Sudan, all right, the Sudan slash West Africa, along the way of the city of Air, and into the countries of Futa Jalan and Senegal, also known as Senegambia, which lies below the parabolic curve of the Niger River most northern reaches where the city of Timbuktu, Mali, presently stands. These Jews were divided into two main groups, 
and took two, two separate directions, further southward into west and into central Africa, all right? These Jews were divided into two main groups and took separate directions, further southward into west and central Africa, all right? This is really where you get your Niger, Niger Congo Bantu family from. The dividing of the Jews going into different locations. Some were going to west, some were going to central. And further down, but let's continue to go on. We're going to jump to an introduction to the history of West Africa. According to De La Fosse, the first permanent settlement of peoples from North Africa in Negro land occurred after the Jewish rising against Roman rule in Censorina in the first and second centuries AD which led to an exodus to the south and the west. All right, so we keep seeing that this event led to a mass migration of Israelites into the Negro land areas, into the West African areas, into the sub-Saharan Africa, I mean areas, all right? A history of the Jews of North Africa. The brutal repression of 118 CE marked the end of the development of Judaism in Censorina. Let me read that again. The brutal repression of 118 CE marked the end of the development of Judaism in Censorinica. The survivors fled westward into Caesarine province and southward crossing the Sahara from oasis to oasis, eventually perhaps reaching as far as the Niger River. All right, so we see that the survivors fled west and south into perhaps reaching as far as the Niger River regions, all right? So this is well understood that these people fled southward. These people fled into these locations after these events. Now, before we go to the Sahara and the Niger River areas, we're gonna stop in Morocco because when um this event happened, now people also went over into Morocco as well, and um years after they was in Morocco, another event happened that um led them to migrate further down into the sub-Saharan regions as well. But to do that, we're going to be jumping to History of the Jews, Volume Three, and it's by Hiram Chigaretz. All right. When the capital, Morocco, after a long and obsolete siege, fell into the hands of Abdullahman, the new ruler summoned the numerous Jews of the town and addressed them in the following terms. You do not believe in the mission of the Prophet Muhammad, and you think that the Messiah, who has been announced to you, will confirm your law and strengthen your religion? Your forefathers, however, asserted that the Messiah would appear at the latest of about a half a century coming after the Muhammad. Behold, that half a century has long passed and no prophet has arisen in your midst. So even, even our ancestors in Morocco was waiting and professing that the Messiah will be returning soon. All right. Just like we are today. All right. We always been waiting on our restoration. We always been waiting on the Messiah generation through generation. Furthermore, the patience with which you have been treated has come to an end. We can no longer permit you to continue in your state of in unbelief. We no longer desire any tribute from you. You have only the choice between Islam and death. So they had the choice between Islam or death, but we continue reading. It says the despair of the Jews at this stern proclamation was very great. It was the second time since they had come under the rule of Mohammedans that the mournful alternative was offered to them, either to surrender their life or their faith. All right. So they can either become Mohammedized Jews or lose your life. Moved by the representations that were made to him, Abdullahman modified it, the edict by allowing the Jews to immigrate. All right, so remember that um, he allowed the Jews to immigrate from Morocco. So keep these Moroccan Jews in your mind. Now that I just went over this information, we're going to get out. We're going to go into a video seeing what these Moroccan Jews look like. You find some very interesting pictures of the Jews of Makadur. Upon closer examination of the four pictures, 
It is clear to see that the Moroccan Jews of the past were highly melanated beings. Here we see black Jews walking through the Medina. Below we see the same dark skinned Israelites at the Bab el Masa in Magador, which was built in 1769 during the reign of Mohammed ben Abdullah as part of the reconstruction of the fortification of the city. As you can see, there is an engraved inscription above the arch as to when and who constructed this forted gate. In this recent picture of the same door, a close and more detailed inscription can be seen. This picture isn't quite as clear. However, the fourth picture clearly depicts these ancient Israelites who lived in the Medina as menonated people. That video was just to show you that we are dealing with the, the original Negro, the original African Shemitic Israelites, all right? We're not dealing with no pale skinned European Israelites um, fleeing through all these countries and migrating to all these places in Africa. All right, even when we take it to this book, Memories of Absence, How Muslims Remember Jews in Morocco, we find a picture of what? A Moroccan Jew or a converted Jewish Muslim, as it says down there. And we see that he's obviously dark complexion. He's obviously Negroid, right? Furthermore, when we take it back to the title page of this book, these are pictures of black Jews, pictures of Moroccan Jews in these locations. And we clearly see the black skin and we clearly see this nose sticking out. All right. But let's continue on. And we're going to jump to in every tongue. We're going to start moving down now. We're going to jump to every tongue in every tongue. All right. Timbuktu Mali. There are several thousands people of unquestioned Jewish ancestry in Timbuktu Mali. Egyptian Jews began trading with tribes in the northern part of Mali as long as biblical times and pushed further and further into the Sahara throughout the centuries. In the 8th century, the Redanites settled in Timbuktu and used it as a base from which they could solidify their trade routes through the desert. In the 14th and 15th centuries, Jews fleeing Spanish persecution settled in Timbuktu. In 1492, King Asika Muhammad took power in Timbuktu and threatened Jews with execution who did not convert to Islam. So we see all the way up again in the 15th century, there was another event in Timbuktu, right? When he said convert or be executed as well, be converted or killed as well. So it goes on to say, some Jews fled, all right? And when we dealing with this, we have to think logical because Moroccan Jews just fled from um, the north Right, Jews from Morocco just fled down to the southern parts of Timbuktu and things of that sort. So they wouldn't flee back up into the north war. the Mohammedans had control. They would flee south or further down into the interiors where there was not Mohammedan rule. All right, some converted and some remained in Mali, suffered, suffering centuries of persecution. By the 20th century, there were no practicing Jews in Mali, all right? So more than likely, they're Mohammedized Jews, all right? Just don't know who they are because they family have been so notched up in Islam. And more than likely, others fled down into the Nigeria area or throughout the other Western African countries. I'm going to jump to an account of Timbuktu and Hausa, territories in the interior of Africa. All right, Yahudi, a great trade route. This place is reported to be inhabited by one of the lost tribes of Israel, possibly a immigration from the tribe of Judah. Yehuda in African Arabic signifies Judah. Yehudi signifying Jew. It is possible that many of the lost tribes of Israel may be found dispersed in the interior regions of Africa. Right? He says it is not impossible that many of the lost tribes of Israel may be found dispersed in the interior regions of Africa. When we shall become better acquainted with the continent, it is certain that some of the nations that possess the country eastward of Palestine, when the Israelites were a favored nation, have immigrated 
to Africa. All right, so they're talking about Yehudi. This is a place up near the Timbuktu Hausa area. All right, so here's Yehudi on the map up near the Timbuktu Hausa area. Furthermore, we're going to be jumping to West African countries and peoples, British and Native. We're going to start in the highlighted. The Ten Tribes of Israel, after they were left to follow the dictates of their own mind and during the commotion and destructive warfare, which ensued the escape utterly extermination, migrated according to the usage of times in vast numbers into various countries, but principally into northern Africa, as it then represented, excuse me, as it then presented the safest and easiest route. Once settled, every commotion and intestine war had the most powerful effect on inducing these migratory bands to shift their abode still further and so lose all connection with the other branch of the tribe. As hundreds of years passed on and generation after generation roll away, they lose a great many of their habits and customs, becoming more amalgamated with the population with which they associate. But when Mohammedism overspread northern Africa, destroyed by fire and sword, destroying by fire and sword, right? The most I said he would send a sword, right? All of those, another religion, the Israelites descendants or the inhabitants of pocket, uh, uh, occupying the central portion of Africa pass forward, seeking shelter into the south and west. A part, namely those from the east central crossing the Banu or Jalaba branch of the Niger, descended gradually southward and became intermingled with the original inhabitants. Protected from excursion of the north by the Banu River and quietly settled between the Great Niger and the Old Calabar River. They remained in peace and grew from one generation to another in idolatry, but still leaving tangible proofs in the form of their religion of the Judaistic origin of the inhabitants. So what we have to understand is, even when we look in scripture, Israel was dealing in idolatry. So just because you deal with idolatry, that doesn't make you an Israelite. Or that doesn't make a tribe not an Israelite. But let's continue on. We're going to go to Africa being an accurate description of the regions of Egypt, Barbary, and Libya. Now, I've run over this before, but this just goes hand in hand with what we read now because we keep seeing all these Israelites coming to this Niger River area. All right, this Niger River area. It's something about this Niger River. All right, so many Jews are also scattered over this region. Some natives boasting themselves of Abraham's seed, inhabiting both sides of the Niger River. Others are Asian strangers who fled thither either from the desolation of Jerusalem by Vespasian or from Judea, wasted and depopulated by the Romans, Persians, Sarsians, and Christians. All right, so those are four or five different events. So that's four or five different waves, four or five different migrations of Israelites into this Niger River area. All right, so that was really, that's really what I wanted to bring out or shine to light because we have to understand that we just did not get into Africa or we just didn't get to these places we are with one migration. No, it was multiple migrations over years. And yes, we did keep in touch with each other, no matter if we was in Western Africa or we still have family in Jerusalem. Because what we would see is Israelites <laughs> Israelites fleeing from the north would go and settle amongst the Ebos sometimes. But we're going to continue to get into that. Furthermore, or else such as came out of Europe, which they were banished, out of some parts of Italy in the year 1342, out of Spain in the year 1462, out of Low Countries in 1350, out of France in 1403, out of England in 1422. These are all different habits and are divided into several tribes. All right, they are divided into several tribes, having no dominion, though both wealthy and numerous, but despised of all nations, and so abominated by the Turks that they are not admitted to being Mohammedans unless first baptized, all right? They always want to baptize the Negroes. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and wrap this video up. We're going to stop right here at the Niger River area. And when we get back, we're going to get into some of these tribes that this is connected to, all right? 
So we should have the understanding that it, it was well known that the Israelites was in North Africa, right? Places such as Egypt, Ethiopia, Libya, Morocco, Mauritania. So we should have this understanding that they was up there and events led to them coming down into the Sub-Saharan Africa regions and the Niger River, which we just reviewed. All right. I could have went into the tribes, but that would take so long, so, so a lot, like a lot of time. All right. So what I'm going to do is we're going to upload individual videos of these tribes that are connected to these North African Jews. All right. These North African Israelites, tribes such as the Ashanti, the Akan, the Mandi, the Yoruba, the Igbo, um, the, the people of the, um, the Bantu people of South Africa. All right. The Tutsis, the Airways. All right. So we're going to do a long playlist of videos concerning our people and how they got to Western Africa. Because our history has to be taught because they're not teaching it. We have to pass our history down to our young ones, like our forefathers used to do to us before we got into this predicament we are in now. So um, just make sure you continue to like, subscribe, and comment. So just make sure you can keep on standing in the word, continue to stay prayed up. And, you know, the Most High going to continue to send us this knowledge. The Most High is going to continue to unravel things for us during these last days and you know, just stay fast, stay, stay, stay motivated and stay in the word, man. Don't, don't lose your faith. Don't lose your faith no matter what. And with that, I say shalom and told out to everybody for watching.